Hi again. The general topic of this course is the relation between music and society. What we have found out so far in this first module is that music is omnipresent. It's almost around us all day. But beside that, we also talked about the specific roles and functions that music can have. Today I will have an interview with Thomas van Straten, who is innovative manager at Consumatics. And we will discuss with him how music is able to create certain atmospheres at certain places. Consumatics is a company which investigates, maps and adjusts unconscious customer behavior in order to improve the relations and the contact between the clients on the one hand and organizations or enterprises and industries on the other hand. And as they write on their site, approximately 95% of human behavior takes place on an unconscious level. And Consumatics helps these organizations to somehow use this knowledge and to affect this subconsciousness. So, welcome Thomas. Thank you. Consumatics is not specialized in music design only, but focuses on a more general way on the subconscious behavior of customers and clients. However, could you say something about the importance of music on how customers react and behave? Sure. Um, on a basic level, uh, the brain constantly receives input from all our senses. And it's just simply way too much to process all the time. Um, so if you simplify the mechanisms, the mechanisms behind it to the extreme, you could say part of the information is always discarded and part of it is summarized into an overall experience. And the elements that make up that overall experience can be anything from temperature to scent to light to decor to music. Um, and when you look at retail, for instance, particularly music with its profound effect on association and emotions has a very strong impact. Um, so you can see, for instance, um, that when you play quicker music, faster tempo music, um, it tends to raise the heart rate a little bit, tends to make us breathe a little bit faster. And we also move a bit quicker through a retail store. So that means that when you play slower music, you can have people stay a little bit longer in your retail venue. So that's typically the kind of thing that is affected by music um, among tons of other uh, factors that are important there. You were just talking about uh, the relation uh, between customer behavior and uh, playing slow music, playing fast music. Um, now my question is how do you come to that knowledge? Is it coming from empirical data? Is it coming from scientific research? Or is it just simply a trial and error? Uh, you try something out and see if it works or not. And the reason I'm asking is that, uh, coincidentally, I was yesterday at a small Suriname eatery, and this guy who knows that I'm dealing with music and I know something about music, uh, he asked me, so, you know, what do you, what do you think? Should I play music here or not? And, and if so, what, what kind of music? Uh, I guess it will not be Beethoven. So I was simply thinking, okay, if this guy would contact you as uh, guys from Consumatics, how would you advise them? So is it going through empirical research or scientific research, or are you just having a chat with him and saying, oh, perhaps it's best to try this out, and if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, we try something else. Yeah, it's a combination of, um, I think, as is often the case with music, of, of art and science. Um, we like to start by analyzing the formula and the brand that we're working for at that moment. Um, and from that we can usually distract some uh, very concrete objectives, like um, in the case of the music tempo, do you want to serve as many people as quickly as possible, or do you want to take your time with a single client, and you can usually find like 20 of those sort of um, objectives that can be detracted from the, the formula that you're working for. And then we look at the, the available scientific literature um, to see whether such questions have been uh, researched and whether we can get hints from there like okay it might be a good idea to do this or maybe that genre would be uh, interesting to test maybe indeed quicker music or slower music um, as indicated by those studies um, but then as you can imagine if you start puzzling with different parts from different studies in a specific situation 
the, the result is completely unpredictable. Um, so we then have to check whether it actually does what we set out to, uh, to accomplish. So it's a combination of basing your decisions in the available knowledge, but then trying out if it's actually done what you want to do. So you say you're working on various levels. On the one hand, it's, uh, you use empirical data, you use scientific research, you of course talk to your client, what are his wishes and desires. Now, my previous interview, Anahit Kasabian, writes in a bu book, Ubiquitous Listening, that Muzak or background music focuses on environmental control. So somehow you try to control and influence the behavior of the customer or the client. Now, my question is, to what extent is that possible? Because if you take the client as an individual person, his or her emotions, associations, background, uh, what he or she went through through this day differs enormously. So how can you ever be sure that the music that you're playing um, really works for this client? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, musical taste, for instance, it, it's so hard to predict what someone will like because it's based on so many aspects of their their previous experience and uh, and all these things but you're always working with averages here so um, when you look at an individual client like does this music match his or her world perfectly well chance is pretty slim but um, any formula will have um, their own specific target audience and there are uh, ways you can judge you can make assumptions about larger groups um, a fun uh, example I recently heard is that people tend to uh, stick with music they like when they're about 27 years old. It's music that tends to stick with them throughout their lives. So that's something of an indication when you know the age of your target audience that can give you a sort of hint like where to look for the proper music. And there's hundreds of those little factoids that you can use to try and single out um, a group uh, rather than an individual. But yes, you're always working for groups. It's impossible to, to work for an individual. So you, you said something now about uh, recent research which, uh, which tells you that, that uh, people like to stick to the music that they heard when they were like in their late 20s. Um, can, you, can you say something about other recent developments that you encounter in, in the way uh, music is used in, in uh, in, in organizations or in, in, in enterprises, etc. So is, are there certain trends? Is there a certain change taking place in, if we look at the last 50, 60 years, for mm -hmm. example? Well, what I find really, really interesting, which is rather more recent even, um, is the fact that uh, before you could measure sales of music. So you could see uh, which records sold best and um, make some assumptions based on that. Then if you had uh, customer loyalty cards, you could basically make a profile of music listeners, like people who bought this album also bought this album. But that's as far as you can go. And now with the streaming services, there's all these analytics behind them. And one thing uh, they found recently is, for instance, that the taste people uh, say they have, the music they prefer, and the music they actually listen to most, there's quite a big gap between those two things. And now's the first time when you can actually measure that and be sure about it. And so that's a really nice development for, um, for music marketing as well, because you get a way better sense of what people actually enjoy rather than what they say they enjoy, because there's a huge gap between the two. I come to my last question, which is perhaps a bit of a nasty one. Um, but in, in one of the next modules, we will elaborate on the relation between music and ethics. And it seems a very relevant issue here as well. Uh, people could easily regard your work as unwanted manipulation through music. So in other words, is it somehow justifiable to use music in such a way that it turns people into consumers? So how far can you go there? And what are the limits actually? Mm -hmm. well, I think it's, it's a very relevant question. I think every marketer should, should be aware of um, of the effects here um, and the implications. But in this case, I think it's interesting to look at it from several angles. Um, one is the depth um, at, which the, um, at which your influence reaches. Um, you can nudge people like slightly 
into one direction or into the other, but you can't manipulate them into doing something against their will. So you might, for instance, um, put someone in the, in the right mood to be optimally open to the retail environment, which might lead to some impulse purchases. But you'll never come home from a shopping experience thinking, what's this? I, I don't remember buying this or I don't want this. Or, so you can't bypass the, the actual will of the person making the decision. So that's, I think that's an important nuance to be made. Okay, Thomas, many thanks for the interview. You now heard two interviews, um, one with Anahit Kasabian, a scholar who discussed the atmosphere uh, that music can create from a more academic perspective, and Thomas van Straten, who approached the same issue from a more practical and commercial perspective. In the next video, Hafez will shortly reflect on these two interviews. So, See you soon.